This video was brought to you by Nebula. Since Donald Trump's comments encouraging Russia to do whatever the hell they want to delinquent NATO members, the idea of a potential Russia-NATO war has become a major talking point in security circles. Last week, Putin warned that sending NATO troops to Ukraine would end in nuclear war. And only a couple of days ago, a Russian missile nearly killed the Greek prime minister while he was visiting Odessa, sparking another round of anxious chatter about the potential triggering of NATO's Article 5. So in this video, we'll take a look at the renewed escalation of NATO-Russia tensions, how Russia might destabilize Europe, and whether a Russia-NATO war could really happen. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So first, let's look at the current geopolitics. Obviously, the immediate concern for both Russia and NATO is the ongoing war in Ukraine, and until this conflict approaches an end, it's still a little early to be talking about a Russian attack on NATO. However, this doesn't mean the idea is that far out. Last month, at a press conference in Poland, Estonia's foreign minister said it could only be three to four years until Russia launches an attack on NATO, with similar estimates given by Denmark and Germany. So to understand the situation, we need to look at the geography around the Baltics, which is likely where a Russia-NATO conflict would first break out. With Finland and Sweden finally in NATO, eight NATO member states now directly border the Baltic Sea. Now, the region's geography would shape a possible conflict in a couple of ways. Firstly, the flat terrain of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania makes them vulnerable to a ground attack. And considering Russia managed to occupy twice the size of Lithuania in the first months of its invasion into Ukraine, this has sparked major concern in these states. Then there's the Savalki Gap, a sparsely populated 60-mile strip of rural land between NATO members Poland and Lithuania, which also links two Russian military strongholds, the Russian exclave Kaliningrad and Belarus. The Savalki Gap has been called NATO's weak point, as it's the only land access the three countries Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania have to the rest of NATO. So in response to this threat, NATO has been ramping up defence along its eastern flank since 2022. Norway, Sweden and Finland also started their joint Nordic response NATO exercises on Sunday, following an agreement back in March to develop a joint air force. And in January, Germany, the Netherlands and Poland signed a new deal to speed up the cross-border movement of troops and weapons to NATO's eastern flank. The Baltics themselves last month agreed to build anti-mobility defensive installations along their eastern borders with Russia and Belarus, and have begun building civilian resistance through conscription and other civil policies. Next year, national defence education will be compulsory in all Latvian schools, while all public media from 2026 will be published only in Latvian and another European language, which doesn't include Russian. Nonetheless, Baltic leaders have insisted that NATO still isn't doing enough, with the Estonian Prime Minister saying that existing plans would effectively allow the three countries to be wiped off the map by Russia if Putin decided to invade. Comments like this have sparked a debate in the West about whether a Russian invasion of NATO is really plausible, and how much money and political capital the West should spend preparing for this outcome. After all, Russia is currently struggling in Ukraine, so what makes it think it could take on NATO? Well, to be fair to the Baltics here, at least before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia enjoyed a pretty significant military advantage in the Baltic Sea. Russia has already built up two military strongholds in Kaliningrad and Belarus, which hosts joint military exercises with Russia. In part because many NATO members around the Baltic Sea have focused on their armies and not their navies, NATO naval forces in the Baltic Sea are generally small and lack sufficient anti-ship coastal artillery to defend against Russian missiles from Kaliningrad, including nuclear-capable Iskander ballistic missiles. Russia's Su-24, Su-27 and Su-30 fighter aircraft are collectively capable of launching as many as three or four dozen more anti-ship missiles. And while Russia's offensive abilities through its Baltic fleet have developed rapidly since the late 2000s, NATO navies have focused largely on mine warfare and mine sweeping, which is in part a response to the fact that Russia has the world's largest sea mine stockpile in Kaliningrad, with an estimated 250,000 anti-ship mines that could be used in grey zone tactics targeting energy infrastructure or civilian exports. But while it's true that Russia enjoys a military advantage in certain respects around the Baltic Sea, a full-on war is still unlikely, because it would quickly spiral out to involve the whole of NATO, and that's a war Russia just can't win. Nonetheless, this doesn't mean that some sort of Russian challenge to NATO, or at least a specific NATO country, is impossible in the near future, for the simple reason that, even if Russia doesn't want war with NATO, it still wants to undermine it. The most obvious way to do this would be some sort of managed escalation that would test the limits of NATO's mutual defence clause, Article 5. This could be some sort of hybrid warfare attack on a NATO member, like damage to undersea cables or energy pipelines in the Baltic Sea. 
or as we nearly saw a few days ago, an attack on a NATO politician in Ukraine. Damage to undersea cable infrastructure, for instance, would enjoy a degree of plausible deniability, and it wouldn't be a direct incursion into NATO territory, so it wouldn't be 100% clear whether or not this merited a NATO-wide response under Article 5. Introducing some ambiguity into the application of Article 5 could strain intra-NATO relations and potentially pave the way for further Russian escalation. Another possible form of managed escalation would be a limited Russian territorial claim on some remote bit of NATO territory. You can imagine, for instance, Putin declaring a security zone or some other ambiguous territorial claim over somewhere like Svalbard in Norway or a remote part of Lapland. Some NATO members, like for instance a Trump-led America, might be reluctant to go to war over what they perceive as some unimportant bit of Europe. And even if NATO did trigger Article 5, this would still be relatively safe for Russia, because they could immediately withdraw their territorial claim or focus whatever forces they deployed to that territory. The point we're making here is that even if you think a full-scale invasion of somewhere like Estonia is unlikely, that doesn't rule out a NATO-Russia conflict in the near future. Because, well, a ground attack isn't necessarily what the beginning of a Russia-NATO conflict might look like. And there are a whole other load of ways in which Russia could escalate against NATO in order to put pressure on Article 5. And even so-called managed escalations can quickly spiral out into a full-on war. If you want to keep learning and expanding your knowledge, then I'd recommend that you check out Wendover Productions' brilliant series, The Logistics of X. Now, you likely know Wendover already, but in this series, they dive deeper into the logistics and operations behind everyday things, from search and rescue operations to ski resorts and coal mining. One episode that I think you'll particularly enjoy is their latest, which gets into the logistics of weapons manufacturing, something that's key to a number of topics we regularly discuss on TLDR videos, and something that directly impacts wars and conflicts around the world. It's a brilliantly researched and thorough series that's exclusively available on our streaming service, Nebula. Now, as you likely know, Nebula is a service that we built with a bunch of our creator friends and is the home to tons of smart educational content from all of your favorite creators. The best part is that by signing up, you not only get access to exclusive series like The Logistics of X, Modern Conflicts from Real Life Law, or China Actually by Polymatter, it also directly supports TLDR. That's because you signing up contributes to the budget of these big budget documentaries and helps us grow and expand our ambitions. So if you want to get more superb content and support TLDR, then if you sign up using the link below, you not only support us directly, but you also get Nebula for 40% off an annual plan. That's less than two pounds a month. So thanks for your support and for backing Nebula.